Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Tavener and I'm your host of Any Further Questions. You are listening to episode one of series two. If you haven't listened to them already, series one consists of six episodes and are all available to listen to on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. So please do go and check them out now. My guest today is our new Gresham Professor of Astronomy, Chris Lintott, and he's joined me to answer a heap of questions we didn't have time to get to during his first lecture of his new series, Island Universes, Discovering Galaxies Beyond Our Milky Way. Welcome. How are you, Chris? I'm good, thank you. Nice to be here. Good. Thank you for joining me. As well as being our Gresham Professor of Astronomy, Chris is also Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Oxford. Listeners may recognise him from television as he currently is a co-presenter on the BBC's Sky at Night. He is also a podcast host himself, or a co-host with his dog Max. His podcast is called Dog Star, so please go and check that out also. I'll start with a question we had during the lecture that you gave. I study astronomy and I can never put into words why it is so important to us as humans to study and understand the universe. What makes astronomy so important? Well, it's nice to start with something nice and specific, isn't it? Yeah. Um, On one level, I think it's quite hard to make a case that astronomy is important. In some sense, you know, what the price of milk and whether we make it to work today and and indeed most people's mood at the end of the day isn't affected. Astrologers, notwithstanding, about what's happening above their heads, about what's happening to to the stars, the planets, and indeed the distant galaxies that I talk about in in the universe. So, um, you know, I don't want to make a claim that astronomy is vital to your everyday life. Um, the, the traditional way to answer this question is to to point to the technological spin-offs of scientific innovation. Say, you know, we can't decide now what science will produce useful things in the future. Who knew that your ability to navigate your car based on Google Maps or, or whatever on your phone depends on GPS. GPS depends on a relativistic correction that depends on Einstein's theory of gravity. So if Einstein's theory of gravity didn't exist, then you'd get slightly lost going to those shops to buy the pipe milk. You know, we point in astronomy, we point to Wi-Fi, uh, which was developed by radio astronomers, to the camera in your phone, which you know was commercialized or, or developed from military technology technology by astronomers. Um, And so there's all these spin-offs, but that's not why most of us do it. Um, Mostly, I think, it's about um, learning to think about ourselves as denizens of this large universe. I genuinely think it's good for whatever passes for the soul to spend some time thinking about the cosmos, to put earthly problems to one side, and to try and find out... um, where we sit in the universe. I also think it's a a subject of tremendous excitement. I think things are changing all the time. I think new discoveries are happening all the time. It's making these Gresham lectures a nightmare because I have to keep updating them and rewriting them, not because I'm naturally disorganised, but because uh, new things keep happening. Um, Friends of mine discovered things a week before the last lecture I had to rewrite. Um, So so I think it's it's a fun subject to to think about. It's an important subject to do, and it has these spin-offs as well. Um, From a Gresham perspective, um, the one thing I find that I I mentioned in the lecture is that people are naturally interested in it, that the subjects of our study, um, the questions that we ask like, how did it all begin then, or are there aliens out there, are the same questions that you get when you you talk to somebody in a pub or in in a cafe. Um, And I don't think, with the greatest of respect, I don't think that's true of my condensed matter physics colleagues. Right, You have to jump a few hoops to get to the things that keep them up at night. And so it is this subject of broad interest, and thus it can be a, a sort of gateway to science for many people, or a gateway back into science for people who perhaps were put off at school. There's a huge sense of mystery behind the, the subject of space, universe, galaxies. I, I feel like with the other disciplines of science, there's a lot that we we know and that we've discovered already. There's a lot we don't know, or well, probably more than we don't know than we do. Do you think that taps into our curiosity as human beings as well? Yeah, maybe it's that the unknown is more obvious. Mm. Um, there's the, there is this sense of exploration, like um, you know, going on a voyage to the ocean depths and... Um, you know, you can see the unknown. It's the blackness of space. So it's not just, you know, there are physics problems that we don't understand. We don't understand the details of how stars form. As I say in the lecture, we don't understand, perhaps we're beginning to realise we don't understand the very beginnings of how galaxies formed. Um, But there's also just places we haven't been. There are things we haven't seen yet. There are uh, new vistas and and new horizons to seek out. So there's that kind of explosion as well. When... um, the Mars rovers trundle around on the surface, when they send a picture back to us 
um, if you're online on the right website at the right time, you could be the first person ever to see that bit of Mars from that perspective. Um, that's pretty cool. So it's that connection that someone who doesn't necessarily study science or have any skin in the game can have that sort of connection to something. That's right. And it's still a subject about looking as mm. well. A lot of the time, as I've discovered with my citizen science work, where we've invited you know, millions of people to come and help us sort through the data. The sort of natural curiosity that says things like that galaxy looks funny. Well, that's a perfectly valid science observation. Another thread that ran through the lecture the other night, but which hopefully will come up in, in my future talks, um, is also this idea that astronomy is about making simple observations very well. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it is about complex physics, but a lot of the time it's you know, can we measure the brightness of a star or its position incredibly accurately? Uh, it was measuring the positions of the stars very accurately that gave us the idea that there were galaxies beyond our own in the first place, or at least that the Milky Way was a was a galaxy in its own right. And and so there's nothing hard about that. It, it's incredibly difficult, but it's not conceptually hard. Uh, and I think that makes a difference as well. Will we ever understand how the universe began? That was a really good question. Somebody asked me that afterwards. I wonder if it's the same person. Um, so I think my perspective on this comes as an observational astronomer. Everything I'm going to say on, in this podcast and in my Gresham lectures is from the perspective of somebody who looks at the universe in as many different ways as possible. Um, and I think when I talk about the Big Bang, I mean, which we think was the beginning, um, or at least of our universe, I think I talk about it slightly differently from how it's often thought about. So to me, the Big Bang theory is this idea that the universe started in a hot, dense state um, about 13.8 billion years ago, as it happens. Uh, and there are lots of things that follow from that statement that I can test. For example, the, the existence of something called the cosmic microwave background, this often called the oldest light in the universe, which we see surrounding us, um, makes sense when you, you have a universe that begins in a hot, dead state. We can do things like um, predict the ratio of hydrogen to helium, or at least the minimum ratio of hy hydrogen to helium, before stars get involved and ruin it. Um, and, and there are predictions we can make just from that statement. That takes us back to there are predictions that tell us what things must have been like uh, a few millionths of a second after the Big Bang mm. that have observable consequences today. But when most people say Big Bang, I don't think they mean a statement about hot, dead state. They mean some sort of perhaps explosion or some sort of zero, some mm. sort of moment, the real beginning. And there, though there are some theory and some ideas, um, some of them extravagantly speculative, some of them perhaps uh, a bit more grounded, um, there, there are no observational consequences of any of our theories, as far as we know. So, so the only scientific answer to the question, what happened at the beginning, is I don't know. Um, the question, though, was will we ever? And I don't know the answer to that either, because there may be some great leap in theoretical understanding, some prediction of what happened right at the beginning that we could test. Um, and then we'll be in business. But we don't have such a theory yet. Do you think humans could develop a technology that could help us understand better. I, I think so. I, I, in the, the history of astronomy is often driven by new technologies, mm -hmm. you know, new ways of looking, bigger telescopes, the drive to look not in the optical but with radio telescopes or high energy telescopes, X-rays and gamma rays and things like that. So um, it is possible that we'll invent some way of looking back right to the beginning. Um, examples might be there are features of that cosmic microwave background, that early light that might tell us about an epoch right at the beginning, which we call inflation. There's this idea that the universe very rapidly expanded right at the beginning. Um, that might have left signatures. Um, people have talked about detecting particles that have traveled to us from those early times. And who knows, maybe we'll invent a big bangometer, right? And you'll turn it on and it'll say yes, and you'll understand that the Big Bang really was the beginning, or it'll say seven, and you'll understand we're the seventh generation of the universe. We, d we don't know. Um, here, though, I, I do think that the breakthrough that's needed is theoretical. Um, you know, it's not even, I can't even tell you that if we build a particle accelerator the size of the solar system, that we'll have any particular insight into that, that t equals zero moment. So I think, I think it is a case of thinking about theory or and maybe, finding, finding new things to test. Yeah, or maybe learning about something learning about it through discovering something else. So, for example, if we discovered life somewhere, 
that life might be able to tell us something that we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, but would we believe them? Um, <laughs> yeah, this comes up. We might. So this is going to come up at one lecture or other. We'll deal with this now. Yeah. If I found aliens, what would I say to them? It's one of the great astronomical questions. The answer is, please come to Gresham <laughs> and we'll do an in-conversation evening. And yes, one of the questions I will ask is about their cosmology. But you're really into the realm of, um, you know, dimension hopping mm. um, faster than light universe skipping multiverse dwelling beings um, that then we'll want to talk to I'm I not think. thinking about aliens like what we see in the films and no. in literature aliens that can speak to us aliens that have been fra- formed in our own minds I'm thinking about just alien life form in a molecular level yeah, well, I mean, that is, of course, is a great question as well. It's, you know, the other great, you know, the two great questions of astronomy um, are, is it, no, I was going to say, is it going to be clear tonight? But I think we, we now we've got telescopes abroad. We're, we're almost immune to that, um, unless I'm there. Um, but the two great questions of astronomy, how did it begin? How did it all begin? And uh, is there anyone out there to talk to? And I, I think progress on both um, would be fascinating. I'm not sure they're that combined, I think. Um, unless... You ask him a more profound question, perhaps, which is to say, why out of all the possible universes, like if you imagine the universe could have any range of properties, let's say the speed of light could be uh, a million times slower than it is in our universe or a million times faster, gravity could be stronger or weaker, the, the attraction of an electron to a proton could be stronger or weaker and so on. If you vary all of those, there aren't many universes that produce a suitable home for our kind of life. And so the connection between the two might be to ask, why are we in a universe that allows for our kind of life? And the easy way out of that is to say, well, you know, we're here. So, of course, we find a universe. Is that touching upon the Fermi paradox? Is that what you're um, to? Maybe. The Fermi paradox is the idea that we, you know, if we're alive in the universe, why are there not, is there not more life? And, and one answer to that is that we're lucky. It's sort of a more, the it usually goes by the name of the anthropic principle, okay. uh, which is the idea that the universe appears to have been fine-tuned so that mm-hmm. we exist. And there are all sorts of good examples, like um, some features of atomic physics, where if you change them slightly, then the sun doesn't work, and then you don't get stars, and thus, presumably, you don't get beings on planets around stars. Um, But, um, yeah, we don't have a good... Again, you need a theoretical framework for how such constants would vary before you can say much about um, whether it is indeed weird that we're in this, this universe of ours. Will we be ever able to see beyond the current observable universe? Oh, it's much worse than that. The observable universe is shrinking. So this is one of the, this is one of the more depressing things uh, that I think about astronomy. So um, the observable universe is the bit of the universe from which light has been able to reach us. Um, and you'd think if you imagine a static universe, then obviously that observable universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger because you know, the more time passes, and so light from more distant regions can reach us. Um, The only problem is that the universe is expanding. Um, And worse than that, the universe is speeding up, for reasons I'll cover in a a future lecture. Well, actually, we don't know the reasons, but we have good observational reasons to to say that the universe is speeding up under the influence of some mysterious force. And so what that means, that acceleration means that stuff is disappearing over our horizon. So the bubble of the universe that we can see is actually shrinking. Um, And so that has a couple of consequences. One is that if you want to to really crack cosmology, you've probably only got another 20 to 40 billion years to do it before you cease to be able to observe anything other than our local neighbourhood. And the other is um, that if you are serious about... um, you know, taking sci-fi seriously and colonizing or at least exploring and sending humankind or human thought or robots that we have built out to explore the cosmos, you should start with the most distant galaxies because the number that you can reach is dropping over time. Could the universe being torn apart during the hypothetical big rip destroy our galaxy in existence or will gravitational forces prevail and hold us together? So this is following on on that same idea. So we've got this accelerating force, which is uh, speeding up the expansion of the universe. And then um, if you want to ask what will happen in the future, there are a few options, mainly because we don't understand what this acceleration is. So one is it sort of peters out and we end up with a universe that reaches a maximum size. Uh, Another is that we carry on the way we're going, in which case uh, things just get 
um, emptier and emptier and the proportion of the universe that we can see gets smaller and smaller. And then there's also a universe in which that accelerating force is becoming more important. Um, and perhaps for some reason, though we haven't observed any sign that this is happening, uh, maybe that would be um, the acceleration would be accelerating. Uh, that's the big rip scenario. And at that point, yes, everything gets ripped to shreds and um, we end up with an extremely boring universe. Uh, but it's not going to happen in the near future. I mean, the questioner asks about whether gravity wins. Well, it's almost a, a definition. If you're in this big rip scenario, you're saying that this accelerating force, which we call dark energy, um, has won out. It's already the most important thing in the universe, but we're not, as far as we can tell, on a big rip trajectory just yet. Okay. And we had one last question about the universe. What do you think of the donut universe theory? The donut universe theory? Yeah. I do that. not know about the donut universe theory. Okay. So um, <laughs> it's tempting well, to say there are probably holes in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is probably a question about the shape of the universe. It is, so yeah. I did some, some light research on this, and there was an article published in March of this year about right. it. And, yeah, you're correct. It's about whether the shape of the universe is a donut shape and not a completely flat shape. Yeah, so the the thing we can say for sure is that our bit of the universe is pretty flat. Um, so we've done all sorts of measurements to try and work out. And uh, flat is a weird thing to say about the universe because you're all picturing a piece of paper. Mm. Um, we mean the three-dimensional equivalent of that, um, or really the four-dimension because you've got space-time, but only my colleague Roger Penrose can see in four dimensions, and I recommend the rest of us don't try. Um, but it's about the geometry. One way of thinking about it is that if you... Um, draw shapes on a large scale in this universe, the maths you learn at school works. So if I draw a triangle between three stars or three galaxies, then the angles add up to 180. Whereas that's not true, for example, on the surface of a sphere. Yeah. So if you do that on Earth, if you go from the North Pole to the equator, along the equator and back up, you form two 90 degree angles and you've still got an angle up at the top. So, um, you know, different geometries apply elsewhere. So what we do know is that in the observable universe... All the evidence tells us that we're flat or very close to flat. Now, lots of people would like to have more interesting structure on larger scales. And I guess it's the donut is a version of that, partly because it helps with some of the problems in our theory, and partly because it could solve things like this dark energy, this accelerating force in some cases. But I'm an observer. There's no evidence that we're, we're pushed to anything but flat. Yeah. When after the Big Bang did planets start forming? Oh, this is a really good question. I actually had a, a summer student, Hannah Blakewell from, from Exeter, look at that this summer. Um, so we don't know the answer to this. We know a few things already. So we know uh, that planets now form really easily, like most stars seem to have planets. But we know that the greater the um, metallicity of the stars, so the more of the star that's made up of things that are other than hydrogen and helium, so in other words, the amount of pollutants that have got into the star since the beginning. You start with a universe of hydrogen and helium, each generation of stars adds in oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and all the rest. Um, so our sun, for example, is a third generation star with material from two previous stars in there. So that metallicity, right, the amount of pollutants, the, the, the amount of raw material you've got left, that increases the chances of having planets. And it seems to increase the chances of having lots of planets. So the first generation of stars, they were just hydrogen and helium. So they almost certainly didn't have planets around them. Uh, but they were very short-lived, we think. Um, not sure. JWST, the, the new space telescope, will help us try and look for the signs of these first stars. But um, they will have been short-lived. They will have exploded in a million years or so. So my guess is that the next generation of stars, and so we're still talking within the first half a billion years after the Big Bang, um, my guess is that those stars have planets. What defines the generation, sorry, between, between oh, the stars? Oh, yeah. So, so when I say the thun, sun, yeah, the sun is a third generation star. What I mean is that the material has been through two previous stars. Okay. Um, so we're made of leftover stardust, um, which is poetic, but rather nice. <laughs> um, it also tells you that, so if we're right and planets formed early on, Maybe different forms of planets formed early on. There was more hydrogen, perhaps, in the disk. The universe was warmer. Maybe you were more likely to grow Jupiter-like planets. Um, maybe Earth-like planets came a bit later. We don't really know yet. Um, but we'll get there as we study more stars in the Milky Way, 
we'll see whether we can find planets around older stars. And, and what? Be, do, what? Sorry, carry on. No, I was just going to say, and begin to a, be able to write the history of planet formation. What defines a planet? Because I know our definition of a planet's changed most recently with Pluto. Yes, I got surprisingly little stick for pointing out that Pluto is no longer a major planet. I, I do like to, to, to get that in as often as possible. Um, so in the, in the solar system, this is controversial. So in, in the solar system, we've got all this stuff that orbits the sun. And the definition at the minute is that it's something large enough that its gravity has pulled it together to be round, mm. um, that it orbits the sun, and that it, it's sort of the largest thing in its orbit. And it's that last one that's controversial because it means that Pluto isn't a major planet because Neptune is there uh, as well. But the distinction is slightly arbitrary. Um, it's just that if you include Pluto, there's about 200 other things that probably qualify as well. And then the mnemonic becomes really long. Mm. Um, I'm trying to remember Eris and Makamaki, and you might as well add in Ceres and Vesta in the Asterisk Belt and a few others as well. Um, out in the universe, we haven't actually had the political argument yet, but I think a good definition is, it, is that a planet is something that's large enough to be pulled together under its own gravity to form a sphere, and... Um, which does not produce its own energy. So slightly tricky because Jupiter and Saturn, the big planets, and indeed the Earth, still have some internal energy left over from radioactive materials incorporated into them when they were born. So they do glow gently, but there's, there's no nuclear reactions going on there. Right. Um, at the high end, we get up to things like brown dwarfs, which are the puniest of stars. Yep. They're um, cold, maybe even planet temperature, um, but they're still generating their own energy at the centre. So that's the distinction. Whether you can point at something and say that's definitely a planet or that's definitely a brown dwarf, that's more tricky. In your lecture title, Discovering Galaxies, we'll move on to galaxies now. Firstly, how do we define a galaxy? Well, I tried not to do that in, okay. in the lecture, <laughs> so I'm not surprised there's a question, question here. Um, so I would say a galaxy is something like a self-gravitating system of stars and other matter. And it's that self-gravitating that matters. It's sort of a clump of material that holds itself together. Now, you know, they come on various scales, from the very large to t tiny dwarf galaxies. And actually, we're beginning to learn, whereas I think we would have made a distinction in the past between the smallest galaxies and large star clusters, things like globular clusters, which have perhaps a few million stars, mm. um, arranged usually in spherical orbits. They're beautiful things to see in the sky. Um, I think we're beginning to see that those populations overlap. And so even the, the smallest galaxies become indistinguishable from clusters. And one of the things I, I tried to talk about in the lecture is how I think a previous generation would have said these are isolated systems, that they live blameless lives out in the void on their own. And we now know that that's mostly rubbish, that galaxies interact all the time, that large galaxies, well, medium-sized galaxies like the Milky Way, are constantly colliding with their dwarf neighbours, absorbing stars and uh, other material from them. And, and really, the, the story of our galaxy, the story of any galaxy is a long merger history and assembly of material from from lots of smaller uh, proto galaxies or indeed just galaxies do we now know the distances covered by the herschel map of the galaxy did they see the edges or constrained to a small local area oh yeah this is this is great this was the um squashed porcupine map of the galaxy which i i made a big deal of which the first um time anyone had systematically tried to map what turns out to be the milky way galaxy um and Perhaps if, if people have heard the lecture, they'll remember that that what the Herschels did was they counted stars in different patches of the sky, and they made a couple of assumptions. But one of them was that they assumed that their telescope could see all the stars. Uh, and what they missed was that dust gets in the way in the Milky Way. So if you're using optical wavelengths, then there's only so far you can see. And I I think the further the nearest stars in Sorry, the furthest stars in, in that map are a few thousand light years away. So they're really just mapping a bubble between us and the centre of the galaxy. There's no spiral arms in there, for example. Uh, it's only when you get to radio astronomy with people like Grote Reber uh, in the 30s, 40s and 50s that you really see evidence for the spiral structure of the Milky Way because with radio you can go push through the dust uh, and really see the broad disk. However, what the Herschel map does do is show you that we're in a disk, and that's a good start because then when you see things like the Andromeda galaxy, 
then the Andromeda Nebula in the sky, and you see that it's this needle-like thing that may be a disk. You can begin to connect the two. So it was an important result, even though it didn't get them to, to where they thought they'd gotten. And how is the distance of a galaxy calculated? As we know, it's the redshifts, but I read that colour of galaxies differ in the telescope meaning distance wouldn't be accurate. Is that right? Yeah, this is this is really smart. And I didn't go down the whole distance ladder. So I talk in the lecture about Cepheids, which are these pulsing stars whose brightness can be calculated by the period of the pulse. Um, and if you see one, in, one of those in a galaxy, you can measure its distance. Um, but for most galaxies, they're too far away for us to see Cepheids. And so people use other things. But, but you're, the question is right, that fundamentally we just measure the redshift. And what this is, is the effect of the expansion of the universe on uh, the g- galaxy's light as it travels towards us. Uh, and so what you do is you look at the... Co- let's start with the colour of the galaxy. Uh, as the universe expands and the light travels towards us, the whole thing is shifted towards the red. And if you can measure how much it's shifted, that gives you the amount of expansion that's happened in the time that the light's been traveling to you. And then you can calibrate that using Cepheids and other what we call standard candles, these things where we can measure the distance. Um, But the question is right again that some galaxies are blue, some are red. The color tells you about recent star formation. Um, And so one approach would be to try and guess the color of the galaxy. So from other clues, like the fact that most spiral galaxies are blue, though not all, you might be able to work out what the colour should be. But a much better approach is to take a spectrum of the galaxy. That then gives you the fingerprints, the the lines in the spectrum which correspond to different elements, and that whole pattern shifts. Right. And then you're on secure ground. So um, the gold standard is to look at the spectrum, and then you see all the lines due to hydrogen and helium and some of the other, and then, then you know where you are in the spectrum, and those are the same whatever the galaxy. Mm. So that gives you the redshift. For new surveys, we can't do that because we have too many galaxies. So we're yeah. back to guessing the color and then calibrating. Right. So there's a whole industry of what's called photometric redshift, photo Z or photo Z if you're in this country, um, where people are making sure we can do a, a half good job at this for future surveys. How do you distinguish extremely far away galaxies from other super bright objects in the universe, such as quasars? Yeah, so this becomes a, a problem when um, we see a new type of object. So particularly with the JWST, the, these distant red blobs that I talk about in the lecture, which mm. are perhaps the earliest galaxies ever seen, the worry until we get a spectrum, the worry is that they are in fact just nearby galaxies of a type we haven't seen before. Yep. But So getting a spectrum is the gold standard, and we'll do that until we understand what we're, getting, what we're looking at, and then we can, can extrapolate from then. If nothing with mass can travel at the speed of light, then how can photons do it? Because they must have some mass. It must have mass in order to be bent. Um, so no, that turns out that's not true. So okay. this is one of the, the great revelations of relativity. So... Uh, a photon is a particle of light so you can think of in modern physics you can think of light as being a wave and that's fine or you can think of it as being a beam of particles called a photon fo- called photons and photons are massless mm-hmm. uh, and one of the reasons we know they're massless is that they travel at the speed of light um, but they can still feel gravity or rather they can feel the bending of space by mass which Einstein tells us gravity is so um, they don't exert gravity. You don't get pulled towards the street light because it's emitting light. Um, but uh, as you go past something massive, it bends space, and even massless objects feel that bending of space. So um, this is why, for example, you get black holes, because light feels the gravity of the black hole. It can't escape, um, not because it has mass, but because space is bent and warped around the black hole so that light can't, can't escape. Could primordial black holes be dark matter? Like how when the universe was in its early stages, could random denser clumps of matter form black holes? Yeah, this is a good question. So I hinted right at the end of the talk that we're beginning, we, one of the things we've realised is that we may not understand how black holes form either. So um, we're seeing large black holes, or large-ish black holes, I guess massive black holes, in some of these early galaxies that we're seeing with JWST. Um and it's tempting to just sprinkle them everywhere because they're kind of fun and they're they're useful for all sorts of reasons. They're very versatile black holes. They have an awful reputation, but they're actually they're very very friendly beasts. They help you form galaxies. They can even help star formation. It's, it's, it's all very lovely. Um, and and we do have this problem that most of the mass in the universe seems to be in a form that we don't understand. 
Um, it's not hydrogen, helium, oxygen, nitrogen, or any of the rest. It's not protons, not neutrons, not electrons. It's not any subatomic particle that we know of. Um, and this is what we call dark matter. It doesn't interact. It doesn't seem to interact with light, but we see evidence for it because we see its gravity everywhere. And it's an old idea that maybe there's just a host of black holes out there. They seem to fit the bill. They don't necessarily interact with light. If they're small, then you may not spot them otherwise. Um, and you could have you need a lot of them. You need the Milky Way to sit in a halo of primordial black holes, but maybe that's okay. Um, but people have looked for evidence that there is a sea of large things out there that uh, we'd call objects. So things like free-floating planets or black holes the mass of Earth or so on. And we do that by looking at distant stars and hoping to see them change brightness because their light is bent by nearby uh, black holes. Now that does happen occasionally. I think there's one well understood black hole lensing event where a large black hole got in the way of a distant star and there are a few other candidates every year um, actually I'm working with a student on trying to understand how many of these we should should expect from, from future missions um, but there's nowhere near enough of them for this to be the dominant source of, black, uh, of dark matter so whatever dark matter is, it's made of things that are particle sized not black hole sized It's a material dark matter could you call it a material? Yeah, I would. I mean, yeah. in some ways, we I think we, we make it over-exotic, right? Because it's mysterious and it's dark and, and all of these things. Um, but, you know, the kind of thing that would satisfy the requirements for dark matter would be um, a new type of subatomic particle, each one neutral and weighing about the same as a copper atom. Okay. If you make, if you, as long as I can make five sixths of the universe's mass out of these things, let's call them lintot particles, just mm. for now. But you know, other people may prefer axions or, or something like that. Lintot particles, uh, is you fine. know. I, well, I feel I that. should do more than speculate randomly <laughs> that they exist. I should try and find one. Yeah. Um. You know that that's all you need. So yeah, dark matter. Like, our theories of dark matter allow it just to be a particle. It's just that we haven't found the particle. Yeah. Um. And the particle physicists haven't helped us out by finding the particle either. We were, I think vaguely hopeful that CERN and the Large Hadron Collider would produce evidence for a massive particle but we've seen no such evidence doesn't mean it doesn't exist mm. um, pe people are doing things like um, putting large tanks of xenon uh, underneath the Italian mountains um, in a place called Gran Sasso and the reason you do that is you hope that dark matter particles sc score a direct hit okay. on one of the xenon nuclei and then you can pick up that background but those experiments have found nothing yet either and so you know in some sense there's nothing exotic but it is true that dark matter is inherently mysterious we had another question about dark matter how does dark matter affect the large-scale structure of the universe so it makes it lumpier right so I showed briefly in the talk, I showed a beautiful cosmological simulation that showed all these galaxies interacting and coming together. And that was a simulation of dark matter, or rather that simulation only had gravity in it. Mm. Um, and that's how we do these things. We go and sprinkle the normal matter in later. Uh, and then you have to worry about what some of my theoretical friends call gastrophysics, all this ugly stuff where stuff emits light and forms molecules and does all this complicated stuff. Um, dark matter is beautiful. It just has gravity. Um, so... If I have less dark matter in the universe, then gravity becomes less important because there's less stuff. And so the exaggerating effect of gravity that takes what are quite tiny fluctuations we see in the beginning and produces this cosmic web of galaxy clusters and superclusters, that's much less effective. Mm. And so what you get today is a smoother universe. The differences between the densest and least dense bits of the universe are less profound. Um, if I went back to the beginning of the universe, added twice as... I'm a bit of a slapdash cook anyway. So if I accidentally add twice as much dark matter to my recipe as I meant to in the universe, well, then I get a lumpy universe in the end. I get big voids with nothing in them. I get superclusters grander than anything we see today. Um, and so that's one reason we think we know how much dark matter there is, is that we can measure the lumpiness of the universe today. We can compare it to what we see in the early universe and we can work out what effect dark matter has had. So, so yeah, it, it really acts as a source of gravity. Okay. Um, that's why it's there. Now, I should say the temptation is to say, well, dark matter seems a bit of a fudge. Surely much better to just fiddle with gravity because mm. I can do the same thing. If I make gravity a bit more effective, mm. then 
with the same initial conditions, I get a lumpier universe. Gravity acts more uh, to, to form greater differences. The trouble is doing that without breaking the solar system or making things work on a galaxy scale. No one's quite managed to find a way to alter gravity to explain everything that we see. Okay. And so most people would say dark matter is still a likely explanation. Right. Could quasar stars be responsible for ultra-massive black holes like TUN-618? So quasars are a, an old category of object. When people built great telescopes in the middle of the 20th century, things like the 200-inch uh, what's that, about five metre reflector at Palomar, mm. uh, which I still think is the largest telescope in the world that has an eyepiece fitting. Okay. Um, and I nearly got to look through it once and didn't, I'm still upset. Um, they started finding in the early universe, a bit like JWST is now finding these red blobs, they found um, a host of what appeared to be stars, but at cosmological distances. So the, something was shining brightly but as a pinpoint not as an extended galaxy and it took a while for people to develop imaging techniques so you could all see that these pinpoints were at the center of, of fuzzy galaxies and what we were seeing was and these are quasars quasi stellar objects which became quasar and these are objects where there's lots of material falling onto the central black hole that lurks at the center of any galaxy but these are ones with active black holes and so you see the light from the material that's falling onto the black hole as this star at the center of the galaxy um, and so these are clearly systems where the black holes are growing fast. Uh, in many cases, they're systems where the black hole has already grown. So these are very massive black holes. Though there is still a rule that the more massive the galaxy, the more massive the black hole at its center and vice versa. So quasars sit on that line. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about seeing large black holes in the very early universe, then or very massive black holes in the early universe, probably they've gone through a quasar-like phase where there's been a lot of accretion onto the centre. The question is why that happened so early. Um, and that, I think, needs an explanation to do with how these systems have interacted with their surroundings, whether they've merged, whether you know maybe there's some something fundamental we don't understand about how gas gets into the middle of these systems. Yeah. But I think they will have gone through this quasar phase. Quasars have become a bit odd as a distinction because as we've gone on in the 20th century and into this century we've learned not only that all galaxies have black holes at their center but that they turn on and off so you can go through periods where your galaxy is a quasar and then you can go through periods where you're a normal galaxy yeah. so it's not so much a distinct object anymore but more a phase that galaxies go through would the square kilometre array be able to look at the first forming stars further back in time to what we have currently observed? So the SKA is a radio telescope, okay. um, which we're building, well, we're designing now. I say we very loosely here, uh, but colleagues of mine are heavily involved. And, and it's going to cover um, bits of Western Australia and Southern Africa. So it's an array of, of dishes. Um, the square kilometre bit comes from the original design. That was the collecting area. Uh, rather than the, the size of the spread. Is it doing this right now? Is it? Well, the nice thing about radio telescopes and arrays is that they work in bits. Okay. So we're at a point where we have a couple of instruments which are what they call 1% SKA. So they're about 1% of the total mm. power of the telescope. But they're already working, producing amazing results. There's one called Meerkat in South Africa in particular that's done things like a beautiful radio map of the centre of the Milky Way. Um, we're using it, my group's using it, to look at radio transients, things that flare, including um, some AGN, some stuff where black holes are feeding. Um, for the first stars, it's harder because they might not be radioactive, as in active in the radio. Um, but we will, hopefully, I think SK you can think of as showing us almost every galaxy. Okay. So we'll get a census of those first few billion years mm. uh, through the gas that's in the galaxy so the nice thing about switching to the radio is that you see the gas in the galaxies in the infrared and the optical we're seeing the stars and so we need that other half of the story uh, and if SK is built or when SK is built to its full extent it will really fill in the whole history of, of the universe um, and then but for first stars I think we want JWST and I think we're going to need to take a very very deep look at one of these patches of sky where there's apparently not much going on but which blossom into galaxies when you when you look deeply. It's really exciting. Um, you mentioned in your lecture that JWST, anyone can apply to yeah. use it. 
Um, is that the same for S? As well. um, I think the, the policies for SKA are still being sorted out. Meerkat belongs to the countries that have invested in it. Yep. So uh, there is a program where anyone can apply for time, but most of it's parceled out in big programs. So there, there are groups of people who are already looking at galaxies or transients or, or whatever. Um, hopefully it will become more open and more international as time go, goes on. Um, there's certainly a commitment to release the data uh, after a certain amount of time so that everyone can then play with it. So the reason that SQA was built wasn't just for one particular reason. It was just so that we could further our understanding of of the universe and the yeah. beyond. So, so often I think there's a distinction. So that goes back to, to the question about why do astronomy? I yeah. think on a personal level, one of the things I like about astronomy is that we build observatories rather than experiments. So in my head, an experiment is designed to test something. Mm. You know, in some sense, the Large Hadron Collider, though it's doing many things, was built to test the idea that there was a Higgs boson, yeah. and that if you collide photons together, uh, protons together, then you can find it. C- tick done. Now we now they're talking about building a different experiment, which will study the properties of the Higgs boson, or perhaps more loosely, a collider that will take us to a new energy range. Um, in astronomy. Still, we build observatories that are designed to look at many different things. Mm. And there's great synergy between the different science cases. So JWST um, was designed, I think, mostly right at the beginning to look at the early universe, to look at the distant galaxies. But then that means building a big infrared telescope. So then you can look at the core parts of our galaxy, which means you understand star formation. And then during the whole time that uh, that JWST was designed and developed and built, um, we've had this great flowering of exoplanet science, of finding planets around other stars. And suddenly an infrared telescope is the perfect thing Mm. for looking at some of these exoplanets. So um, we do have this ability to jump around. Um, The fun bit is that often the science cases that telescopes become famous for, the discoveries they become famous for, aren't those that they were built to do. So if you look at the greatest hits list of Hubble, uh, which has now been in orbit, what, 30 years or so, the original thing, it's done some of the things it was supposed to do. Uh, It was supposed to measure the expansion of the universe. We call that the Hubble's constant. That's why it's the Hubble Space Telescope. It did that. But we didn't expect it to discover this acceleration, this dark energy. We'd certainly never thought about exoplanets. Uh, Comet hit Jupiter in in 1994. We didn't know that was going to happen. It was observed brilliantly. Um, The the plumes of Enceladus and and things I'll talk about in my next Gresham lecture. Um, There's so much of the universe that we didn't know about when Hubble started, but it retains this observatory flexibility um, to to be repurposed. Uh, And, of course, you can upgrade the cameras as well, so it's a much better telescope than than when it started. Um, So, yeah, so this this is the fun part. It's not press a button and get an answer. It's explore the universe. It's basically just building pieces of equipment and then using them as time goes on for your own different purposes, very similar to how... You could say the personal computer was built. Maybe. The computer yeah, yeah. was built to sort of input data and to produce spreadsheets. No one would have foreseen then that it was going to be used in, the, in how it's being used now with the internet. And all yes, that I, think, I, think that, I, th- I think I think that's right. I think, yes, yeah, so though we're sort of in that, that realm that's always mocked, you know, there are all these statements about, you know, we could foresee a world in which every town may have a computer of its own and yeah. things like that. You know, I think we are still in a world where some of these instruments are very special uh, and there is one. JWST and so the bun fight to get to use it is, is strong and of course we want to to do some of the science that we built it for and yeah. that, that people spent years arguing uh, uh, about but it'll be the fun extra stuff that, that will be I think really memorable We had a comment during um, your lecture the Earl of Rose built the Great Telescope and he lived in Burr, a town in County he, Offaly in the east of Ireland. Uh, he did, yeah. yes. No, I. you know those times when your head goes goes blank? I knew I was reaching for something. It's the Earl of Ross. Okay. Uh, uh, but yes, he was. I've described him as the Earl of Burr in the west of Ireland, which is utterly wrong. Uh, this is the place that had Leviathan, the, the large telescope. So this is how you, how you know the lectures are live and unedited. So yes, the Earl of Ross and indeed the current Earl of Ross, I will apologise. You, uh, you will get more of these as your lectures go look, on, I, I you want, get very attentive Gresham. Look, I once got the age of the universe wrong on, on screen for the BBC by a factor of a billion, and we got one letter. So I figure, you know, you're already ahead, Gresham, but please do. We'll have a regular we'll have a regular things Chris got wrong last week feature. So yes, of course, the Earl of Ross. 
how far away are we from resolving the crisis in cosmology? I'm not sure what they're referring to. Oh, well, Do you know what they're referring to? Yeah, the co- it's tempting to say that the coffee machine ran out, so hopefully okay. that's fixed. <laughs> yeah, the, there is. this will come up. This is stuff I, I will undoubtedly talk about towards the end of this, this year's series. So we talked a bit earlier about measuring the um, speed with which the universe is expanding. And there are two different sets of methods of doing that that don't quite agree with each other. Um, it's quite funny. The crisis in cosmology is uh, certainly I've used that word, but you know it's a sort of new scientist, scientific American. It's pop sci. Um, the scientists themselves are calling it the Hubble tension because okay. because te- it's not quite a disagreement because you can just about stretch and make the measurements match, but increasingly they don't. Um, and it's fascinating, partly because the two camps, which have very different methods, have swapped data and they can't disprove each other. So there seems to be something real here. It's not not that somebody, you know, forgot to carry a two at a crucial moment or, you know, that sloppy code from a Friday afternoon. It, there's an actual problem. Uh, and what's interesting is one set of methods looks at how fast the universe is expanding now by studying not Cepheids, which I mentioned in the lecture, but other standard candles. Though there's some Cepheid people in there as well. Um, others look at the early universe and extrapolate. And so either we don't quite understand the objects we're using as standard candles, or there's some fundamental physics we don't understand. And at the minute, there's probably 2,000 people in the world working on this, and no one's quite sure how to make this tension go away. So I, I, I wouldn't say yet that we're at a crisis, I will say that in physics, it's always the time when there's a couple of niggling loose ends that need solving that trigger a new revolution in in how we're thinking. It's never the moment where you think, oh, everything's awful. We must invent an Einstein and rethink gravity. It's always, well, we've basically done, but the the orbit of Mercury doesn't quite make sense. It's always these small things. So, So maybe we're at one of those points. Thank you very much for joining me today, Chris, and thank you at home for listening. By the time this episode is released, Chris will be preparing for his second lecture in his series, The Marvels of the Solar System. Can you tell us a bit about it? Sure. So I thought we'd come back to home for a second lecture and stay in nice familiar confines. So we'll be staying within the Oort cloud um, and with the host of planets that that surround the sun. And I think that the thrust of the lecture is that I think the solar system has proved to be a much more interesting and varied place than we thought even 20 years ago. Um, I, one way of telling the history of, of the exploration of the solar system is that you know, we had thousands of years of speculation about what these worlds m- must be like. And I think in the 50s, 60s and 70s, as the space probes went out and explored, there was almost a sense of anticlimax, that Mars was a dusty world, that Venus was a hellhole, that Mercury was just a rock, that Jupiter looked pretty, but you know, was a spinning gas giant. Um, And while all of them are interesting scientifically, I I think there was some sense that the story was kind of done. But more recent probes have told us that there are habitats for life all over the place, that there are exotic and wonderful worlds from Titan where raindrops the size of uh, lawn tennis balls fall so slowly you can dodge them to Venus's atmosphere, which might harbour life, um, to, I don't know, uh, water ice mountains on Pluto. Uh, And so really it's a story of the, it's a celebration of the variety of of places we've still got to visit in the solar system. Sounds fascinating. I've got one last question before I let you go. Will Max be joining you for any of the Gresham lectures? See, this is a good question. I'm I'm under um, negotiation with his agent, but uh, unfortunately we can't afford him. So I think you'll start with just me. Thank you very much, Chris. (laughs) 